Welcome everyone to Door County Library's uh, Zoom session on butterfly gardening. We're at the Ake Harbor Library with Karen and Karen is a master gardener. She is also, um, she runs the, uh, Karen, you're going to have to help me. At <laughs> Door <laughs> County <laughs> Landscaping, you run the nursery, right? The manager, yep, that's right. The manager of the nursery. And she was in my uh, master gardening class. She's a real expert. She's got a great garden at her own house. <laughs> and she's going to share with you um, the art of having a butterfly garden. Hey, hey. <laughs> well, let's take over, Karen. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. And thanks to everybody for joining us today. Um, I know that in Door County, it's a beautiful afternoon and, and a lot of people might rather be out in their garden putzing around outdoors. So I appreciate that you've decided to join us here on Facebook or on Zoom. Um, so I think what I'm gonna do is just jump right into the program. If you do have questions, um, you can either put them in the chat uh, if you're joining us by Zoom, or if you are on Facebook Live, you can make a comment and we'll cover the questions at the end. Um, or if you're phoning in, I think at the end, we can just open it up. And if anybody does have any questions, we will uh, tackle those then. So we will jump right into, whoops, I have to share my screen, don't I? Hold on, hold on. See, I'm still learning all of this technology too. Okay, share screen is right there. Okay, let's try that. Yeah, there we go. Okay, am I sharing now? I'm I can't sure I see right. Oh, there we are. Okay, okay, awesome. So uh, today's program is really gonna be Butterfly Gardening 101. It's gonna be some of the real basic information about what to do as you're planning and putting in a butterfly garden in your home landscape. And Karen, um, are you sharing a, um, a presentation that, right now? I thought that I was, hang on one moment. Yeah. The technology is, all right, I have share screen. When I select that. Oh, I see, I missed a button. Let's That's try okay. that. Aha. I think we've got it now. Yeah, there, that's better. Got it. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, butterfly gardening 101. Some of the real basics about um, what to think about when you're planning a butterfly garden. Um, what kinds of things are going to be beneficial? And toward the end of the program, I'm going to be talking a lot um, specifics about plants that are really good for butterflies. So we'll get to that stuff kind of at the end. So. I, when I was thinking about, you know, thinking about this program, I started thinking about um, the fascination that we have with butterflies. And even people who don't like insects very much, and there's a lot of people who don't, um, what's not to like about a butterfly? You know, it's, they're beautiful, they're colorful. You can approach them fairly closely to observe them. Uh, they don't bite or sting or do anything negative um, that I can think of anyway. Um, so they're, and they're a great, it's a great opportunity to learn because we can get so close up to them. And so people have really become fascinated with butterflies and in turn with gardening and how do we attract, how do we plant the things that are going to attract butterflies so we can observe them up close. And it, I'm glad to see that people are getting more interested in butterfly gardening because butterflies do need our help. Because of a lot of human activities, um, butterflies have lost a great deal of their habitat, um, especially over the past 20, 30 years or so, um, due to think practices like agriculture, urbanization, um, expanses of lawn, um, which our, our country especially seems to be kind of enamored with. Um, those kinds of places probably were good butterfly habitat before they were altered. Um, and we also have to think about climate change and how that's affecting habitats and affecting butterflies. Um, as climates warm, sometimes the synchronization, I guess you'd call it, between butterflies and their plant, the plants that they need to survive, 
are kind of off. The timing is off. And, and so we don't really understand what the, the full impacts of climate change are going to be. Chances are they're not going to be very positive. Um, the butterflies that we're most familiar with in terms of scientific research are monarchs. Um, monarchs have been studied extensively over the last, oh, probably close to 50 years, really. And so we have a lot of good data on populations of monarchs and what's happening to them. And if you take a look at this graph, you can kind of see, well, there are highs and lows, but the trend is definitely downward. Um, some monarch researchers say that um, the populations of monarchs have probably declined like 90% in the last 30 years or so. So that's a huge decline. And some of it is due to the factors that I mentioned before, habitat loss and climate change. We don't really know how that's gonna to continue to affect monarchs in the future. But I think that if you, we don't have a lot of data like this on other butterfly species, but if we did, I'm guessing that a lot of the trends would be the same, again, because of habitat loss. Now, the good side of that fact is that we can create habitat very easily in our backyard landscapes. And some people might say, well, you know, I just have this little tiny yard. What difference is that going to make? If we have a lot of small habitats, a lot of backyard habitats combined, they can make a huge difference. It adds up to a lot of acres, if you think about the acres that we have in our backyards now. So we can, all those little habitats can make a big difference in terms of butterfly populations and supporting butterfly populations. Well, the big question is, how do I get started? There's so much information out there. What do I do? I don't know where I should even begin. Well, it's really pretty simple. Butterfly gardening is exactly the same as any other kind of gardening in terms of how you plan for it and how you design it and so on. You could do an extensive landscape and fill your whole backyard with butterfly gar with garden plants. Uh, you can do a small bed that's just for the butterflies. You could even do a container or two with plants that are attractive to butterflies. It can be as big or as small as you want. Very, very elaborate or very, very simple. You just have to think about what it is that the butterflies need, what it is they're looking for in their habitats. Kind of the butterfly wish list. Um, I like to compare it to, you know, if you're gonna buy a house, you have a wish list. You want this many bedrooms and this many baths, and maybe you want a, an open concept, or maybe you want a historic house, or maybe you want a pool. Those are our want lists. Well, butterflies have a want list in their habitats as well. Food is the obvious thing that we wanna provide. And with butterflies, we have to think about um, providing food at all the stages of their life cycle. Um, butterflies eat very different food when they're adults compared to when they are caterpillars. So we'll talk a lot more about that a little bit later on, but in order for a butterfly garden to be really effective, we want to include food for both stages. Water is an important consideration. Of course, butterflies need water just like we do. Very, very easy to provide that. And then some kind of shelter. This is an aspect that sometimes we don't think much about, but I won't say that butterflies are fragile, but they are affected by wind, by rain, uh, predators hunting for them. So butterflies do need to have some kind of shelter, some kind of protection where they can get away from the elements or get away from their enemies. So we wanna consider all three of these things when we're putting in our butterfly habitat. So we'll start talking about food. And as I mentioned, um, the food of an adult butterfly is very, very different from the food of a caterpillar butterfly. Um, most of the plants that you see in the store that are labeled butterfly friendly are, are labeled that because they are good sources of nectar. And of course, nectar is what the adult butterflies are gonna be feeding on. So when you're looking at a butterfly friendly plant, it's a good nectar plant. The butterflies as adults are generalists. So they feed on a whole variety of different plants. Um, nothing real specific, you know, whatever has lots of nectar, they're going to use that. As caterpillars, they're a lot more specialized and we'll get to that in just a moment. It's also good to remember that some butterflies have weird food habits, I guess. Um, some butterflies will feed on rotting fruit. Some butterflies actually feed on animal dung. Not the kind of things you're going to put in your garden, probably. I don't know, maybe. They do actually make fruit feeders for butterflies. 
So you can put some old apples or a icky black banana. And a lot of butterflies, I've seen people who take um, slices of watermelon and just put them out in the yard for the butterflies to feed on. So most of the time, again, we're looking at nectar plants, but if you wanna put out some kind of a fruit feeder uh, or whatever, you can do that in your yard as well. Looking back at the food angle of things, um, we also have to think about host plants. Host plants are the food that the butterflies eat when they're caterpillars. And the example that most people are familiar with is monarchs. Monarchs are very, very specialized as caterpillars. They will only feed on milkweed plants. Now, I will say there's a lot of different kinds of milkweed out there, but they have to have some kind of a milkweed for the caterpillars to feed on. The adults, they feed on a variety of different nectar plants. There's a few other examples I wanna just kind of throw out here um, of native plants that are good host plants. You might not actually see the butterflies feeding on, this, on the flowers, but the plant itself is uh, food for the caterpillars. So this first example, this is a plant called white turtle head. It's a native here in Door County, it grows in kind of wet areas. Um, the flowers look a little bit like a snapdragon or like the head of a turtle, if you use your imagination. The white turtle head is the host plant, caterpillar food, for the Baltimore checker spot butterfly. And so the only places that you'll find this butterfly are areas that have the white turtle head growing there because the caterpillars are dependent on it. Plants that are in the parsley, dill family, um, celery, Queen Anne's lace. Um, this one is a native plant called golden alexanders. All of the plants in that family are great host plants for swallowtail caterpillars. So if you're growing dill in your garden, you may find some of these caterpillars feasting on your dill as well. Uh, wild indigo, false wild indigo, is the host plant for a little butterfly called the silver hair streak. And I, I really like this one because the caterpillar is so interesting. He looks exactly like a leaf. Beautiful, beautiful camouflage there. So let's talk a little bit about water now. Butterflies don't need much water. So you don't have to have a pond for them or a bird bath or anything like that. You've probably seen butterflies like these sulfur butterflies doing what's called puddling, which literally means that they're getting water uh, from puddles or sometimes even just muddy, moist spots on the ground. The butterflies are not just getting water, they're also getting minerals from the soil. So they're getting a little extra boost in that way too. Sometimes butterflies will get water from tree sap and that too, there again, the sap has some sugars in it that uh, provide some nutrition for the butterflies as well. Very similar to drinking nectar. And there's some of those butterflies who get their moisture in rather untraditional ways. Again, finding uh, animal droppings uh, or from rotted fruit, they would get water from that as well. And then there's the aspect of shelter. As I mentioned before, butterflies um, like to be able to find some kind of shelter from weather, especially rain um, or very windy days. Butterflies won't be flying on a really windy day because they just can't do it. And also predators. Um, a lot of birds like to eat butterflies. So the, they're gonna be looking for some kind of shelter in their habitat. So now that we know a little bit more about what the butterflies are looking for, we can start planning what we're gonna put into our butterfly garden and how it's all going to work. What I always tell people to do first is take a look at what's already in your yard. What, what are the pieces that are missing from the puzzle? Maybe you already have a lot of really great nectar plants, um, but you don't have any source of water. Or maybe you have water and nectar plants, but you don't have the host plants for the caterpillars. So, or, or maybe you have, need some kind of shelter for the butterflies. So look at what's already in your landscape and think about, oh, okay, I, I really need to add some shelter or I need to add a water source. That's where you begin with what you already have. I don't advocate that people go in and tear out their entire landscape and uh, put in a butterfly garden because you probably already have things that are useful. Then you can identify, uh, do a little bit of research and figure out which kinds of butterflies you're likely to see in your region. And then you can also look up what their preferred plants are, either the nectar plants or the host plants for the caterpillars. And a really good resource for this that I found is wisconsinbutterflies.org. 
um, you can actually go on this website and you can type in your county and it will come up with a list of butterflies that have been documented in your area. And then you can say, okay, oh, look at there, here's, here's these butterflies. And then you can do a little more research and find out what kind of plants they need or what kind of plants they prefer. So um, I highly recommend that you check out this website. It's got a lot of other really good information on it too, but it's an easy way to find out, hey, I didn't know that kind of butterfly was here in my area. Then you get to the fun part where you start selecting plants. This is, this is my favorite part of the garden. Um, I always recommend to people that if possible, use native species. And the reason for that is pretty simple. Our native plants and our butterflies have evolved together over thousands or millions of years, and they have developed a connection. Um, the butterflies recognize the native plants as food sources. Sometimes if you introduce um, a plant that's from halfway around the world, the butterflies don't recognize that it's food. They may eventually determine that it, it provides food. Um, and then the other angle is that the native plants are the ones that are gonna be the host plants for our native butterflies. So I always recommend native plants. Now I'm not saying that non-native plants are necessarily bad. I'm going to talk about a lot of those a little bit later on because many of them are very, very beneficial as a nectar source. You want to plan for blooms throughout the season because the butterflies are gonna be active um, for a, you know the entire season. And, and I say the entire season, the season really starts in about April. There are actually butterflies that overwinter as adults. Um, the morning cloak butterfly is one example. They emerge early in the spring on those first warm days. Um, a couple of weeks ago when we had that stretch of really nice weather, I saw morning cloak butterflies flitting around and they're looking for food. They've been hibernating all winter. They need some source of food early in the season. So you wanna look at things that bloom very early. You also want to look at plants that will bloom very late. Um, the monarchs, for instance, are migrating in August and September. They need to fuel up as they're heading south. Uh, there are butterflies that stay active into October, sometimes even as late as November. So you really want to have a long season of blooms and you want to plan for things that are early, mid-season and late. Think about adding different heights to your plants because some butterflies like to feed close to the ground. Some of them like to be a little bit up higher. Um, shrubs can get the butterflies even higher up than some of the perennials can. Generally, butterflies are attracted to flowers that are in the pink to orange to red spectrum. Um, there are flowers of different colors, whites that will be very attractive to butterflies, but generally we're looking at pink, purple, orange, red blossoms. And oftentimes uh, plants with tubular flowers or clusters of small blossoms. Think uh, like Queen Anne's lace. It's a lot of little blossoms, but it's a big cluster. So the butterfly can land on that. They can um, move around and feed on a lot of those blossoms. Another flower form that butterflies seem to like are daisy-like flowers, daisies or cone flowers. That provides a nice flat uh, landing pad essentially for them. And they will use those plants uh, again, they can stay on the flower for quite a while and feed from all of the individual little blossoms in that plant. It's also good to plant in groups. Um, I'm a gardener where I plant one of everything because I just can't decide. Um, so in that sense, my garden may not be as beneficial to butterflies because they have to kind of search for, oh, here's a good plant over here and here's one way over on this side. If you plant in groups, the butterflies have an easier time finding those plants. So in this example, you can see they've got kind of daisies in the foreground there. There's some lavender, I think it is in the middle, some black-eyed Susans toward the back. Um, I think some more daisies way in the background. So they've got these groups or drifts of flowers, which the butterflies are going to be able to zero in on. And again, they have a lot of food in a small area. They don't have to spend a lot of energy flying from one side of your yard to the other to get to the food that they want. Water is very easy to provide for butterflies. Um, it can be something as simple as a bird bath that, or a shallow dish that you fill with sand or gravel and then keep it moist. It doesn't even really have to have standing water because the butterflies can siphon that water up from the sand or the gravel. 
um, very similar to those butterflies that we saw earlier that were puddling. Um, so you can provide water pretty, pretty easily for the butterflies. You also want to provide some areas where the butterflies can warm up um, because they're insects and they're cold blooded. Butterflies generally aren't active until the temperature gets above about 50 degrees. So early in the morning, you'll see butterflies sitting on the side of trees, especially on the south side where they're warming up, soaking up the sun. Uh, flat pieces of stone are good. They'll warm up in the sun. Um, I've seen people use bricks, uh, especially darker colored bricks that are going to absorb heat more quickly. Um, even asphalt. I've seen butterflies warming up on the asphalt because it's dark and it absorbs the heat and they can warm themselves up and become active much more quickly. Um, go, going back to the idea of shelter, shrubs and trees are excellent for providing shelter for butterflies, um, especially shrubs like this one that have a lot of stems where they form a nice dense um, structure so the butterflies can get in there and hide from the wind or the rain or the predator, predatory birds. Uh, this particular shrub, I believe this is a dogwood of some sort, also has nice flowers, which are going to provide nectar for the butterflies as well. Lots of clusters of flowers there. So you're getting, you sometimes with, um, if you're careful in selecting the plants you have for shelter, they may also provide food as well. And shelter can be, it doesn't have to be a shrub or a tree. It can be something like a, a trunk of a dead tree that you leave standing in your yard. Many, the, the butterflies that overwinter as adults will often hide underneath the bark of a, a, a loose piece of bark or a, a hollow, little hollow in a tree trunk or a stump. So leaving those standing, if you can, is a good place for butterflies to find shelter, especially for the winter. Uh, leaving some plants in your yard standing during the, during the winter. Um, the whole idea of messy gardening or lazy gardening has, has been uh, growing lately. Um, instead of tidying everything up in the fall, leave some of those taller stems standing. Um, some butterflies will, uh, or moths will make their cocoon in the fall. They will actually spend the winter in the cocoon. And often those cocoons are on taller plants that you know we generally would cut down in the fall. Letting vines grow in your yard, having a brush pile, those are all ways that you can provide shelter for butterflies and a lot of other insects as well. I want to touch a little bit on butterfly houses, and some of you may have these in your yard. Um, in my experience, I don't think I've ever seen a butterfly use one. That's not to say that they don't. Um, I just have not observed it. Um, butterfly houses aren't like bird houses where the butterflies are going back to them every night and going to the same place. Butterflies will take shelter kind of wherever they end up at the end of the day. Um, they may go in there during a rainstorm or a real windy day and then leave and, and maybe never use the box again. I do know for a fact that wasps like to use them. So um, if you like having one, they're decorative, they're kind of fun. Um, I don't know if they're a great benefit to the butterflies, they don't necessarily hurt. So that one I will leave up to you. One thing you definitely don't want to do in your butterfly garden is use pesticides. Even organics, even organic pesticides are pretty broad spectrum. And for example, um, if you're growing milkweed, milkweed is notorious for getting aphids late in the summer. Uh, the aphids just find it and they love it. But if you're spraying for the aphids, you're probably going to kill any caterpillars or eggs, monarch eggs that might be on the milkweed. So you want to be very, very careful with using pesticides. If you can use um, other methods, um, the, the best thing you can do is just kind of learn to tolerate the other insects that are feeding on your plants. And, and you know, if you can stand a little bit more raggedy looking plants and not use pesticides, that's certainly going to be better for the butterflies. Okay, so now we get to the fun part. Now we get to talk about some of the plants that are really beneficial for butterflies. And I'm going to talk about natives and non-natives because both of them can be very beneficial. We'll talk about the native nectar plants first. And I want to mention a bit about milkweed because uh, I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different kinds of milkweed. And depending on the conditions in your yard, you might want to choose one over the other. 
So if we start down at the lower left hand corner, this is the common milkweed, the stuff that you see growing on roadsides and ditches and old meadows. I don't re usually recommend common milkweed for a home garden situation just because it grows and spreads like crazy and it'll end up growing in places that you may not want it. Um, it grows by underground rhizomes and so it'll pop, you might pull up one plant and it'll pop up a couple of feet away. Um, if you have a large meadow, if you have an area that you're kind of restoring, um, common milkweed can be very good because it tolerates pretty tough conditions, fairly dry conditions. It doesn't need a lot of babying. If you're looking for something that's a little bit better behaved for your butterfly garden, um, you might choose the one in the middle. This is called red milkweed or swamp milkweed. It usually grows in with a little bit more moisture, smaller flowers, a little bit darker pink. Um, but this is one that seems to be a favorite if, if the butterflies have a choice between the common milkweed and the swamp milkweed. As far as laying their eggs, they seem to go to the swamp milkweed more. The leaves aren't as thick and leathery, so I suppose it's actually easier for the caterpillars to chew on them. But that's a, a really nice variety for around the edge of a pond. There's a white flowered variety as well. It's really, really pretty. The one in the lower right hand corner is called showy milkweed. This is one that's not native to Wisconsin. It's native a little bit further south, but it will grow up here. And it has bigger flowers. They, the flowers almost look like starfish. Um, the plant size is pretty similar to the common milkweed, grows in much the same method, but just a little different kind of a flower style. The upper right hand there is the butterfly milkweed or sometimes just called butterfly weed. Um, beautiful orange color. There's also a yellow variety that's been hybridized um, that's called Hello Yellow. Um, butterfly milkweed is a good one for a dry site. It likes dry conditions, full sun. I will tell you that it's very, very slow to come up in the springtime. So if you plant one this year and the next year you're looking for it, you probably won't see it until the end of May. Uh, but once it starts going, it takes off pretty quickly. Lovely plant. The upper left hand milkweed is a tropical variety of milkweed, which sometimes you'll find in garden centers. It's not hardy up here. It'll freeze in the, in the winter, but um, it's a nice one to grow. It's an excellent um, nectar plant and the caterpillars will eat it. Um, there's some concern about the tropical milkweed being grown in the southern United States. Uh, the reason is that um, this will bloom year round in areas that don't freeze. And some scientists are concerned that the, the butterflies tend to kind of congregate in areas where this plant is blooming. And because they're in closer quarters, uh, there's a parasite that can actually be passed from butterfly to butterfly or from the butterflies actually to their eggs and then their offspring. So uh, they recommend that you cut this down or get rid of it in the fall if you live in say Texas or Florida. But up here it's fine, it grows well in containers. It really is quite lovely and the butterflies do really like it. Asters, I always recommend that people put asters in their butterfly gardens because most of them bloom fairly late in the season. Um, there are some varieties that will bloom in well into October. And again, that's when um, the migrating monarchs are fattening up for their trip south or butterflies that are gonna spend the winter as adults as they're hibernating need to fatten up. It's a little hard to see in this picture, but if you look closely, you'll start seeing a lot of little orange and black butterflies on there. Those are American lady butterflies. And I think I counted 23 of them on this plant when I took the picture. And this was taken in probably mid-September or so. So definitely look for asters. They come in purple, lavender, white, pink. Um, some will grow in more shade than others. So if you have a slightly shady garden, you can put woodland asters in as well. Cone flowers, that's, this is one that usually most people are aware of as being beneficial for butterflies. These are a couple of the native varieties um, from the left, uh, the purple cone flower. The middle one is yellow cone flower or sometimes called gray headed cone flower. And the one on the right with the droopy petals is pale purple cone flower. These are all excellent um, nectar plants for butterflies. Cone flowers, as you probably know, have been hybridized like crazy. And you can get white ones and yellow ones and orange ones and red ones and pink ones and green ones. Um, with the, the hybrid varieties of cone flower, um, their benefits to butterflies vary quite a bit. 
if it's if it has that same basic kind of daisy shape without any extra petals, usually those are pretty good for butterflies. The inset picture there is a variety called hot papaya. There's a number of uh, cone flowers that have been hybridized so that they have all these extra petals, which makes them very attractive in the garden. The problem is those petals are taking the place of the reproductive parts of the flower. So they don't produce seed, but they don't produce nectar either. And in an area, uh, and I've seen this happen where all these cone flowers are growing together, the hot papaya, the butterflies just don't visit. So I'm not, again, I'm not saying you can't plant them, but they're not gonna be as beneficial to the butterflies as the, uh, as the other coneflower varieties. Blazing stars are another must have in your butterfly garden. And there's a lot of different varieties. Again, some grow in moist areas, some like it really dry. Some can be five feet tall. Some of them are only about two feet. Um, but in that photo on the left, you can see how much the monarchs absolutely love uh, blazing star. Uh, the variety on the left there is one called meadow blazing star. It has little clusters or little buttons of flowers, uh, quite tall, um, probably in the four to five foot range. The one on the right is spike blazing star, or sometimes it's called marsh blazing star. It takes a little bit more moisture and has more of a dense spike. Uh, there's a white flowered blazing star as well. A few other natives that you can consider adding to your garden. We'll start at the top left, goldenrods. Goldenrods are excellent sources of nectar in late summer and fall for a variety of different butterflies. Uh, the top center photo is a penstemon. Penstemon have tubular flowers, which also will attract hummingbirds to your yard. So you're getting two for the price of one with those. Um, the upper right hand photo is Joe Pie weed. The native Joe Pie weed is pretty big. It'll get to be six or seven feet tall in good conditions. And for most people's gardens, that's a little much. So hybridizers have developed smaller varieties. There's one called Little Joe and Baby Joe. Uh, Phantom is a newer variety that gets about four feet instead of six or seven. These have clusters of fuzzy pink flowers that the butterflies and other pollinating insects really love. Uh, the lower right hand picture there, Coriopsis, are great uh, for butterflies and there's a number of native species. The lower middle photo is uh, hyssop, sometimes called anise hyssop because it has a licorice smell to the leaves. And these tiny spikes of tiny little flowers that are very attractive to butterflies. And you can see a couple of bees using them in the photo there as well. And then the native sunflowers. There's a number of uh, different native sunflowers. One will grow in woodlands where it's a little shadier. Uh, some of them like sun, lots of varieties to choose from. Now some non-native nectar plants. And you may already have some of these in your yard. Um, the flocks, like the creeping flocks at the upper left or the taller garden flocks, excellent nectar plants. They will also attract hummingbirds along with the butterflies. Um, the cosmos in the upper right, nice landing pad for the butterflies. They can roam around in there and feed on all that wonderful nectar. Um, on the lower left is zinnias. Zinnias are wonderful nectar plants, bloom for a long period of time through the summer and into the fall. Uh, flowering tobacco, Nicotiana, uh, in the lower middle photo. These get Some of these get quite large, but they provide a lot of nectar also. Tubular flowers, again, attractive to hummingbirds as well. And the photo, the orange one in the lower right is a sometimes called Mexican sunflower. It's a not a hardy, it's not a, a it's an annual grown up here, but it will grow very quickly and is very, very attractive to butterflies. They just flock to that plant. So it's a very worthwhile addition in your garden. A few other uh, non-natives, uh, again, starting at the upper left there, we have heliotrope, lots of little flowers that the butterflies can visit, or lantana in the upper center photo. Those both have those clusters of small blossoms. Salvias on the right is a salvia, tubular flowers with lots of nectar. Uh, the lower middle photo is a verbena. There's a lot of different kinds of verbena. I call this one verbena on a stick because that's kind of what it looks like. And in the lower left, we have alyssum. I like alyssum because one, it's low growing. So those butterflies that like to be close to the ground will feed on it. And it's early in the season. It blooms when it's still quite cool um, and blooms for a long period of time. Butterfly bush, a lot of people like this one. It is very attractive to butterflies. 
It's a little bit touchy this far north. Um, it'll die all the way back to the ground in the winter. It's slow to come back in the spring, but it does come back uh, strong. Once it starts blooming it, or growing, it blooms fat, it grows fast and it blooms for a fairly long period of time. You might wanna consider adding some plants that bloom at night um, in order to attract moths. And there's some really lovely night flowering plants that you can put in. The yellow one is an evening primrose. They open at about four o'clock in the afternoon and then stay open into the evening. Uh, the bottom photo is the, again, the flowering tobacco, Nicotiana, a white variety, or a moonflower, which is a relative of uh, morning glories, but blooms at night. All of those are gonna attract moths, including these beautiful sphinx moths, or what we sometimes call hummingbird moths because they hover the same way that hummingbirds do. Uh, some of these are out during the daytime as well. So this one I think is feeding on some lavender or something, but sphinx moths are really, really neat. Now let's look at the other part of the food equation, the host plants. And again, we'll start with natives and then I'll talk about some non-natives. Um, the native host plants, trees are really wonderful for a lot of different kinds of insects, not just butterflies, but for many other insects. Oaks, willows, cherries, poplar trees, and a lot of the native shrubs are, are great caterpillar food. And they will support literally hundreds of species of insects. And not just the butterflies are gonna be using those trees, but other kinds of insects as well. And I like to mention that having a lot of insects in your yard is not a bad thing um, because those insects are going to in turn provide food for birds. Um, even birds that feed on seeds will usually feed their babies caterpillars or other kinds of insects. So a chickadee, for example, uh, a pair of chickadees has to capture something like 7,000 caterpillars to feed their babies over the course of the season. So um, just planting a tree, for instance, like an oak tree, that's gonna attract a couple hundred different kinds of insects, you're gonna also be providing food for birds as well. A couple of other native host plants, violets. If you have them in your yard, you either, either love them or hate them. Um, but butterflies, like some of the fritillary butterflies, really love the, the leaves of the violet. That's their host plant. Um, or pussy toes. This is a little plant that often grows along roadsides in real dry, sandy areas. Pussy toes are the caterpillar food for the American lady butterfly. Nettles. If you have nettles in your yard, they are a host plant for the red admiral butterfly. So it's good to leave a few of those in the corner for the red admirals. Um, and vines, this is a vine called Virginia creeper or sometimes it's called woodbine, a native up here. It's the host plant for another one of these beautiful sphinx moths called the Pandora sphinx moth. Uh, the caterpillars are about four inches long, about as big as your thumb, big fleshy, weird looking things but they turn into these gorgeous camouflage patterned moths, just really stunning. There are some non-native plants that can be host plants too, even though the butterflies didn't evolve with them. If the plant's in the same family as a native, the caterpillars will use it. So again, going back to the dill, parsley, celery family, um, Queen Anne's lace, all of those are as we mentioned before, host plants for the black swallowtail caterpillars and also tiger swallowtails. So you'll find these beautiful um, yellow and green and black caterpillars chewing up your dill. Lilacs are wonderful nectar plants, again, fairly early in the season, but they are also the host plant for a really cool moth called the Cecropia moth. These caterpillars also, when they're full grown, are about four inches long and fat and very weird looking and turn into these incredibly gorgeous moths. This is one of the moths that makes its cocoon in the summer. After the caterpillar matures, it forms a cocoon, but it stays in that cocoon until the following spring and then finally emerges as the adult. And again, I wanna just go back to the beginning and mention that you know a butterfly garden doesn't need to be a, a huge landscape. It doesn't have to take up your whole yard. Even adding a few containers of butterfly plants will be beneficial. And I, I really like this little garden because they have different heights, as we mentioned. They have something that's vining growing up that trellis. They've got some shorter plants. They've got, uh, it looks like some daisy type things, maybe some anemones, 
um, really nice plantings. It can be, uh, attracting butterflies can be as simple as a few containers on your deck, or it can be very elaborate. I've seen, you know, some huge, uh, incredible butterfly gardens. Um, so it's really up to you how you want to handle getting butterflies into your yard. A couple of resources, again, that you might want to check out. The North American Butterfly Association has some really excellent information on their website. They have brochures on um, basics of butterfly gardening. They have one that's called Flowers for the Butterfly Garden. They have butterfly biology on their website. And they also have some uh, information on preferred uh, nectar and host plants for different regions of the US. They don't have Northeast Wisconsin specifically, but it'll give you a good idea for the Midwest at least, um, what kinds of butterfly plants are beneficial. The other resource that I refer to a lot is Monarch Watch. Um, obviously they are focusing on monarch butterflies, research and um, protection of monarchs, but they also um, coordinate a program where you can get your butterfly habitat certified as a monarch way station. Um, you submit a list of the plants that you have in place and um, where you are, whether it's a rural area or suburban or urban, and you can actually um, get your backyard butterfly habitat certified. Monarch Watch is also the organization that coordinates monarch tagging, which is where they actually, um, citizen scientists, anybody can buy these little sticky tags that you put on the butterflies when they're migrating in the fall. And then it's kind of like a bird band where if the butterfly is recovered later, they can look up the number on the tag and figure out where that butterfly went, where it came from, how long it's lived, and so on. So check out both of those for more information. Um, National Wildlife Federation, I'll also mention quickly, they have some good butterfly resources on their website. So there you have it. You have the basics of how to put your butterfly habitat in. Think about the wish list for the butterflies, food, water, shelter. And most of all, make sure that you have time to enjoy your butterfly habitat. Get out there and watch what's using your area. And um, I'm sure that even with a few plants added to your yard, you'll have a big increase in the use by butterflies. So I wish you lots of success in your butterfly gardening. Um, with that, we will see if there's anyone that had any questions or comments. There we go. Okay, Lydia. Yeah, there's no questions on Facebook, but in the Zoom chat, um, the first question from Renee, she said, well, I guess it's kind of a question. She said, I'd love to know if some of the plants you're discussing might also attract bees or other pollinators. Okay, definitely. Yes, a lot of the, a lot of the plants um, that I mentioned, the nectar plants are going to be um, attracting certain types of bees. Um, there's also pollen, um, which is a lot of the bees and pollinators are looking for. So yes, most of the plants that we talked about are going to be beneficial for a, a wide range of pollinators, not just butterflies. And another question from Monica, she said, what about deer repellent? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I would think that in terms of being, you know, if it's a host plant that you're looking at, um, you wouldn't want to be spraying anything on the foliage. Uh, if it's a plant that blooms, if you didn't spray it directly on the flowers, but that's an excellent question. And I would have to do some research to, uh, to see what effect that would have. Monica, follow, Monica followed that one up with asking, will something like liquid fence harm butterflies? Yeah, that's another one. I'm not, I would have to do some research. Um, some of the deer repellents are just things that, that taste bad to the deer. Whether they would taste bad to caterpillars, I'm not really sure whether they would be harmful. Um, some, of the, some of the deer repellent products are uh, things that probably would not affect the caterpillars, but I would have to do more research to figure that one out exactly. And Sean Matthias does a lot of spraying. Can you hear me there? Yeah, she might yes. be the one to ask. If yes. His, his huge uh, butterfly garden. So mm -hmm. um, she might, I, I, we can ask her and see what she says yeah. about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Lydia, any more questions out there? 
Yeah, there's one on Facebook. Lois asked, what can I do about aphids on my milkweed? <laughs> um, the, the best thing you can do is just tolerate them. Um, you can carefully remove them if, um, with water. If you, you know, just spray the plants with water, um, you may dislodge some caterpillars. The, the monarch eggs are actually secured to the leaves pretty tightly. So if you're using a spray of water to dislodge the aphids, you're probably not going to harm the, the monarch eggs. Um, you, would, you would definitely want to watch and be careful about the caterpillars. Um, sometimes I've just squished them with my fingers, but that gets messy and you never get all of them. Um, the, the aphids are not really going to harm the caterpillars in any way. Um, they're going to make the milkweed look pretty crummy for a while, but um, the best thing to do is just kind of to tolerate them. But that, yeah, that's a tough question because the, the aphids just love the milkweed as much as the monarchs do. Great. Yeah, we have a few other notes and some a lot of thank yous. Mm -hmm. um, one of the notes says wild ones, both Green Bay and Door County have a lot of information too. Yes, yes. I And um, yeah, the wild ones chapter here in the Door Peninsula um, is doing some different programming and there are good wild ones uh, the website is just wildones.org, and they have information about butterfly gardening and uh, other other benefits of using native plants in the landscape. Yeah, that's all that that sounds wonderful, and that's all that we have here for now. Um, again, like I said, a lot of thank yous. So thank you, Karen. We really appreciate having you here today. Oh. This was a great presentation. Thank you. Lydia, You're will you do me a favor and yeah. make make me a host because I switched devices to see a, oh, sure. a video. Um, so if you can make me a host. And uh, again, if you're a master gardener and you need education hours, this is a great uh, resource for you. You can use these for your master gardener hours. So um, were you able to share me? Oh, it looks like it. Yep, you should be able to. Okay. All right, so I was down in Mexico a year ago, March, and um, I was able to, and I don't know if I'm gonna be able to show you. Can you, let's see, can you see that? Those are, um, let's see if I can get any more. That we went down to where the butterflies go and there were just thousands of butterflies. And um, let me see if I can get another picture up. I had videos, but it doesn't look like Zoom is liking videos. Uh, let me try another. Well, maybe let's try this one. Can you see that? No, we can just see the picture of the butterflies on the branch. Oh, okay. How about this one? Let me, let me try sharing again my screen. I'm yes, yeah. I'm gonna stop it. And okay, I'm gonna say share contact. And I'm I'm gonna see if I switched it to screen. Maybe that'll be better. Um, no, that's not gonna do it either. Let me try one more thing. Well, that made it worse. <laughs> All right, photos one more time. Um, yeah, it looks like it's just going to let me, it's not going to let me show, um, any, um, so can you see that one? That's that same one I showed you, yeah. yep. but, um, I have some video content and I can, um, I'll give it to, um, uh, Lydia to put on the Facebook with our video. So you, you can see there are just thousands of them flying around. It was a great, it was, um, probably about hour and a half outside of San Miguel Allende in uh, central Mexico, uh, where these butterflies are. So they're monarchs. It was just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. So now I'm just going to, uh, sh I'm going to stop share of that. And I'm going to share my, um, let's see if I'm going to able to I don't think it's going to let me. I was going to just show my screen, but it doesn't like sharing screens with the iPad. 
Um, let's see if it'll, it'll do it now. No. All right. Um, always something new with this. Um, <laughs> well, I just want to let you know, we have hundreds of monarch butterfly books. And I know after watching Karen, um, I, I'm like, oh yes, that flower, I should have written it down. Um, and so uh, you will be able to just go to doorcountylibrary.org and put butterfly gardening in the search. And there are hundreds of books that we can order for you. I'm putting this one outside for someone uh, today. Uh, we, all, we have um, all of our libraries. You can um, pick up the books outside or you can come in and browse. Uh, we also, our browsing is now up to an hour. So, hey, stop at our library and we'll get you uh, hooked up with some great Monarch Butterfly books. So thanks, um, Lydia, are you still there? I'm still here. Great, because I, I, my screen completely changed. So thanks everyone for coming and thanks Karen uh, for being here today talking about butterfly gardening. It just, it, it encouraged me to get outside and start planting again. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you so much. And um, thank you, Lydia. And hope to see all of you soon at Door County Libraries. Bye-bye. Thank you, Janine. Thank you.